Praise be Jesus Christ. Very honored to have with me today, Mr. Matthew Kelly. Uh, Matthew, welcome. Thank you, Father. Great to be with you. Matthew, remind me what city you're in, what part of the world you're in. Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, great. Cool. I'm in, I'm in Ottawa, Canada. It's just neat the way with these interviews we can be connecting with people in different parts of the world so, so easily. It's fantastic. It's, um, you know, I started speaking and writing in 93, and the only way to get a message to people was to go on the road. And, and that's what I did for a long time. And you know, what's available to us today versus what's available to us then is incredible. People, sometimes young people say, I, I want to do something similar to what you do. I want to write or I want to speak, you know, tell me how you got started. And I tell them the story, but I also tell them I wouldn't do it that way today. You know, there are so many tools available to us that were not available to us then. So, yeah, yeah, I know it's it's amazing. Um, speaking of reaching people, I was just looking at the back of your latest book here. It says, "This is amazing." Let's see if I can just find it. Give me one second. It says your books, his books, have sold more than forty-five million copies. And when I was reading this, I thought to myself, like. You're a high school writing teacher must be really proud of you. <laughs> Interestingly, I failed high school English. No. Uh, my teacher really didn't like me for some reason, and I failed high school English. <laughs> Would have never guessed. Now, this is your latest book. I just finished reading it, Life is Messy. Now, one of the, the kind of problems with this book, it says you have five children. Yes. So how does it work? You go into one of your kids' rooms, you say, hey, clean up your room and your child says, Hey dad, life is messy. Like, how do you respond to that? <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a great insight. And, and the kids are, they, they have these, um, these insights, these intuitions, they're able to take things from here and there and, um, and, and use them against you. It's like, uh, in these, uh, crime shows, you see, uh, people arrested, you know, and, and, and part of the rights that get read, you know, Anything you say can and will be used against you. Uh, this should be read to all parents. You know, when the child is born, you know, parents should be warned that anything they say or write or do can and will be used against them. So, yes, the children very often are asking me, Dad, is that helping you become the best version of yourself? You uh, know, or, yeah. Dad, maybe you should do this to become the best version of yourself. And I'm sure the messy comment will be coming quite shortly when I asked them to tidy up their rooms. <laughs> um, the other day I was in our, our little chapel. I, I live with, in a community of priests and we had Eucharist, just a few of us were doing Eucharistic adoration, two of us actually. And I, as I was leaving, one of the priests, he's the general superior of my community and he, he has a very high regard for you, Matthew. But I, we were just mentioning something about what we were up to. And I just, I said, oh, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm interviewing Matthew Kelly. And he said, like, without skipping a beat, he said, now, and, it, and I bring this up, I, I hope this isn't, you know, isn't awkward for you, but the first thing he says, oh, can you ask him about his locutions? And then he said, can you ask him about the warning? And I, I said to him, I, I don't know, but I said, I'll ask him if I can ask him about his locutions in the warning. I, I know it's a, it's a personal thing, but would you be willing to share, like, what's it like having God the Father speaking to you? Yeah, so for a little bit of context, um, you know, I haven't spoken about it publicly for uh, 25 years. Um, and the reason is because when I first started speaking and writing, I was speaking and writing about it, and... Uh, people were fascinated with the experience, but less interested in the message. Mm -hmm. And that essentially is why I stopped speaking about it in, in consultation with my spiritual director, um, who essentially counseled me the message stands on its own. You know, yeah. people will accept or reject the message. Um, regardless of where they think it comes from. Um, and people seem to have gotten fascinated with the experience. We see this with the apparitions of Mary around the world at different times. Millions and millions of people went there, 
but their lives were not changed because they were more interested in the experience than they were um, in the message. That being said, I, I will say a couple of things. Um, the first thing I would say is that, yes, I have been blessed with some incredible mystical experiences. Um, I think that these things are much more common than people realize, or even than people are open to. And sometimes, you know, God begins to move mystically in their lives and they close themselves off from that, or they doubt that, or they think, oh, that was just me talking to myself, um, and, and, they sh and they shut that down. And I, I, think, I think we have to be open to that because we are a mystical church. We are a mystical people. I think it's also interesting that if you stop the average person on the street today and, and say, describe Catholics for me, they would not describe us as a spiritual people. You know, they would say many, many things about us. They do all these good works here and in schools and in hospitals and for the poor, but very few people describe us as a spiritual people. And, and I think we have, the average Catholic has lost that connection with that deep spirituality. And we do need to open ourselves up more to mystical experiences, in my opinion. Now, that being said, the second thing I want to share about this, which is even more important, um, as I said and as I've shared, I've had astounding mystical experiences in my life, okay? But if you gave me the choice to have all of those experiences again or receive the Eucharist one more time, it's no contest, you know? And... Um, and so it, even the most extraordinary mystical experiences can become ordinary in the context of receiving the Eucharist, having your sins forgiven, things like that. And then if we take it a step further to the priesthood and, and the way the priest participates in confession or Eucharist, now you're at another completely different level, right? And so I, I very often think we elevate mystical experience beyond where it belongs in the hierarchy of spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned a point in, in your book, Life is Messy, that I, I want to get to in a few minutes about, you know, the, the beauty of the ordinary. Um, I, I do, I do want to say when I first discovered you as a young person, you, I think you were still 19, 20 years old. For me, what, what, what thunderstruck me was to know that God the Father cares enough about us to want to speak to his children. But also, I guess we all remember that Ten Commandments movie where Moses receives the Ten Commandments and there's a bolt of lightning and Moses is shaking and, and, and sometimes God get, gets angry and the, the the way you you shared with us how how loving and good the father is and in a, in a moment i want to get to, to one of these quotes in your book and it just i i can't tell you how liberating it was to have this manifestation in our time of the goodness of the father. I mean, we hear about in the gospel, the prodigal son, Jesus's goodness. He said, who has seen me has seen the father, but just to have this visitation, you could say from God, the father through one of his children. Again, for me, it was, it was a game changer, you know? And, and I, I just like, I long for every person on the face of the earth to know how, for them to know that they have a father in heaven who loves them more than they could ever imagine. And so uh, that, that's what struck me, you know, just, just the, the goodness of the God who made us. Um, you probably get that a lot, eh? Well, I, I think, you know, God's providence is complete. And I don't think that it is a coincidence that at a time where there is such poverty of fatherhood in our culture, that God as Father would manifest in the ways he has manifest. And 
um, because we need to rediscover the role of fatherhood in our lives, in our society, um, in each family, because so many of the problems in society can be traced back almost directly to the poverty of fatherhood uh, in the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, now, again, the second question, I, I apologize if I'm being a little bold with this, but there's this best-selling book. I haven't read the whole thing, just one section, but your mention is called The Warning, and a lot of my prisoners have read it, and you're included in it, and I, I just wonder, if, do you have any comment on your sense of the times we're living in and kind of the... The, the criticalness of things, any comments on that? Well, my first comment would be I'm included in the book um, sort of against my consent, um, without my consent and against my will, um, yeah. you know, because I think it, it's taken something out of context. And and what it's what the book has done is taken something out of context from many, many different people and created like this very intense experience. Um, so it's like taking all of Jesus' teachings, you know, on one subject and putting them uh, between the covers of something. I think that is dangerous. I think it, um, so I do believe that is dangerous. That being said, um, you know, these writings are prophetic. And so they cannot be taken literally. We are not fundamentalists. Um, and uh, Catholics quickly become fundamentalists uh, when reading private revelation that is, is shared um, or made public. And we, I think we really have to be careful of that. Um, but in that context, I don't think anybody believes that the world is not in need of a warning, that the world is not in need of um, a shakeup, that the world is is not in need of being awoken, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that um, what I would say to people about that experience is don't wait for it. You know, ask yourself, what is the essence of that? And, and move towards that now. I believe the essence of it is an awareness, is, is a growing awareness. You know, um, I think all valid spiritual experiences increase our awareness. You know, if we're really uh, participating in the spiritual life, you know, water tastes differently, food tastes differently, spending time with people changes us in ways that it, 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 it elevates every human experience. You know, um, why do people take drugs? Because they're looking for an elevated experience. They're really looking for God and spirituality, for connection with God and spirituality. They're really looking for this greater awareness, this, this elevated experience. And so what I would say to people is God wants to give us an awareness. He wants us to wake up. We do sleepwalk through life um, at different times, sometimes for long periods of times. Um, we do sleepwalk through certain experiences, even ones that we that we love, that we know are the most important. We can find ourselves drifting off thinking about other things. Um, and I would just, I, I think the prayer that emerges from the recognition that the world needs this awakening, the prayer should be, you know, Lord, awaken me now. Yeah. You know, increase my awareness, you know, increase my consciousness of, of what is happening within me and what is happening around me and how I act affects other people and how I speak affects other people. Make me ultra aware. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's these movies, um, Jason Bourne movies, you know, there's these uh, action, you know, movies. Have you, have you seen them, Father? Yeah, yeah I have, yes. You know, but Jason Bourne, he's got this hyper awareness, right? He's aware of everything that's happening all the time around him in a, in a like a supernatural way. Um, like think about those gifts at a mystical level, at a spiritual level. That's that's what God wants to give us. You know, like when Jason Bourne walks into the room, like 
he knows who's carrying a gun and who could beat him up and who he could beat up. You know, when we walk into the room, we should be able to tell who is the saddest person in this room. Who is the person in this room who most needs my encouragement today? Who is the person in this room that most needs me to love on them right now? Um, I think as we awaken spiritually, that that's the kind of awareness that that God gives us with. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I pray for probably every day and I I just plead with the Lord as I ask Lord, Lord, like, show me, you know, I want to see my weaknesses. I want to see my broken brokenness. I want to see my sinfulness. I want to see how I'm hurting people, how I've hurt people. I want to be able to repent of any and every way I've offended you. And and like that's that, that's a deep longing of mine. And, and you know, with that living in a state of repentance. And and so yeah, I agree with you. Like this this grace of seeing our souls as God sees them. Oh wow, like that that should be one of the deepest desires of every Christian, you know, to to not be, you know, clued out or sleepwalking, like like you say. Um, I'd like to just ask you about one of your quotes. I, I love this little book. I know I did a little video on it, uh, Our Father, little sayings um, from God the Father. But this one here, again, this this one was revolutionary for me. When I read this, I, I think I was still a teenager, but it just, it, it gave me so much encouragement. And this is it. You, you wrote, try. This one word sums up all I ask of you. And when I read that, I was just like, you know what? I'm I'm a mess. I'm a work in progress. I keep falling and getting up. But if there's one thing I think I'm doing is I'm trying. And if that's all God the Father asks of me, maybe maybe I'm doing okay. Do you want to just comment? Do you remember that quote? Yeah, I mean, it, I remember then and I remember now. And I know specifically how it's affected um my own fatherhood and how I father my children, you know, um, I think we live in a, um, we live in an accomplishment addicted society. Um, and one of the things I've learned, you know, through passages like this about fathering is if my child gets a great grade in school, I, I shouldn't praise the grade. Okay. Because it's not really the grade that matters the most. It's it's how my child um, approached the work, and and the outcome is the grade, mm. you know. And so, my daughter did just fantastic um, in an area that she'd been really struggling with um, prior to this year, and and she worked really hard, you know. And when she got her grades, she was so happy and so excited, you know. But what I said to her, is, I said, Isabel, I'm I'm so proud of how hard you worked, how hard you tried. I know you really struggled in this last year. And I want you to know that I'm delighted that you got that grade. But what I'm proud of is how how hard you worked and how hard you tried to get that grade, you know? Because I want her to know that my love is not conditional. It's certainly not on a grade, you know? And that, um, and that the things... I want to praise the things in her that God would praise in her. Yeah. And and so that's that's what that particular passage makes me think of. Yeah. I, I meet a lot of people. I mean, we're all we're all struggling, but I, I think some people they they really think God is is mad at them or, or they're not pleasing to God because again, they're struggling. They're they're not doing the best, but I can see that they're trying so hard and you know, and and I, I just think to know that all God asks of us is that we try, you know, because, you know, we grow little by little, it, you know, is, is just so important uh, for people. Let's turn to your book, Life is Messy. <laughs> Great book. Now, this is interesting. When I when I read the first little section there, the first uh, installment, it, it's kind of amusing. You know, you talk about life is messy. You can't change that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, this is fun. But then it's like you, you a little later, you go into the deep end, you know, and it's almost like when I was a kid learning how to swim, they take us into the deep end. And sometimes it felt scary deep. It was so deep. And, and you get deep there at, at a number of points. But at, at one point, you describe how every year between 
Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, New Year, you reflect on the year. And one of the questions you asked yourself was, was this the best year of my life? And you said for 30 consecutive years, every year was the best year ever. And then you had a year where, no, it was the worst year. And you thought, okay, probably just a glitch. Then you had the next year, it was even worse. And you said you went through three brutal years. Um, yeah, the following year was worse again. Um, do you want to just comment? And then you get into the dark night of the soul, John of the Cross. Do you want to just comment on the, the reality that, like, the gospel is not prosperity gospel. Everything is going to be perfect in my life. I'm not going to have any struggles. Not only will we have struggles, but in the Catholic tradition, we learn about the, the, these purifications, these dark nights. Saint um, um, Faustina writes about the dark nights. Saint John of the Cross, Saint Teresa of Avila, others. What, do you want to share just what this dark night is about? Yeah, so maybe first let's talk about why I chose to share that. Um, I chose to share it because, I mean, they really were three very miserable years of my life, very, very difficult years of my life. And um, and while that's happening, everything else is still going on. And, and I live a public life. And I think sometimes um, when we live a public life, uh, People can stop thinking of us as people, you know, and and can make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, he's got a great life or he's got it all together or whatever. And I, I wanted to not only dispel that myth, but I wanted to crush that myth. Um, this is a book I never intended to write. It's based on my own personal journals from those three worst years of my life. Um, but as last year began to unfold and a COVID experience, I think so many of us started to see the cracks in our lives, the cracks in our culture. And I wanted to talk about this brokenness that we all experience. And, you know, the central question of the book that I propose is, is can something that has been devastatingly broken be put back together and and be more beautiful and more lovable than ever before. And we struggle with that question because in our consumer addicted society, if we break something, we throw it away and, and buy another one. But, but what do we do with our broken selves? What do we do with our broken relationships, our broken institutions? Uh, these cannot be thrown away and you can't buy a new one. And and this is the the dilemma that we face in this sort of disposable culture. And it's a dilemma that leads to an incredible amount of self-loathing in people. Um, I would say especially religious people. I think it's, it's, it's a, a dilemma that leads to many, many people feeling woefully inadequate, especially spiritual people. Um, and, and that is not how God wants us to, to think or feel. Um, but in order to get to where the mind of God is, we have to make sense, make peace with our brokenness. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, at the beginning of the book, I do share about that very, very dark time in my life. Um, but then I, I do take the book, I, I believe each reader will have to decide for themselves. I do take the book then to what I believe is a very hopeful place and hopefully a very helpful place. Um, but that darkness is, again, we spoke about mystical experiences earlier. Um, I, th I believe a lot more people experience this dark night, uh, but they, they don't recognize it as that, or they brush it aside, or they think there's something wrong with them, you know? I think that, like, when we experience fear, or when we experience depression or anxiety or you know doubt or whatever i think very often people think that th they are malfunctioning as a human being and the exact opposite is true you know when we feel fear or depression or anxiety our, our whole being is working exactly as god created it to our, our being is throwing a flag and saying hey pay attention there's a problem here 
you know, and and the dark night of the soul is like an extreme experience of that, right? Mm -hmm. And but very often we um, we ignore it, or we don't know how to approach it, or we don't know who to talk about it. I think I think it's astounding. I think one of the great sadnesses of our age is that there are an enormous number of people who, if they have a spiritual question, they don't actually know someone who they can bring that spiritual question to who will sit with it and take it seriously. Yeah. It's one of the great poverties of our time, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you highlight, I was, I was going to bring this up, and just for our viewers to catch this, because this is central in your book, you ask the question, can something that has been broken be put back together in a way that makes it more beautiful than ever before? And it, it, do you mind if I give a spoiler here? Do the, it. Answer, the answer is yes, our creator God can do that and he is doing that and it's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, just, just a real kind of hope for all of us, because we're all, you know, we all have, we're all earthen vessels, eh? Or another crack pots, you know, and, and we you know a lot of brokenness. So just a, a, a tremendous hope. You, you mentioned a moment ago, too, that you, you said even institutions, you know, and um, the last two years have been very difficult for me with the scandals in the church. And I, I, I didn't really know how to respond to them, what to do. And I, I found myself speaking out against the corruption, not having a clue what I was doing. Um, and, you know, just, just not knowing, I guess we all heard the saying, uh, you know, the only thing evil needs to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And I, I just felt that, you know, something had to be said and, you know, not knowing how to say it. Um, any, any thoughts on, I guess, yeah, the, the 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 brokenness of the church, even the corruption, some of the corruption in the church and all that. I, I know you mentioned your, your doctor friend who went on to becoming a priest and then, you know, passed on. You kind of challenged him about challenging the, you know, some of the situations in Australia. Like, what do you have to say, maybe even to priests who want to be bold and courageous, good shepherds, fight off the wolves, we want to, you know, we don't want to be good men who do nothing, but yet, obviously, we we want to be respectful and obedient. Like, how do you, and we don't want to be, like, say a piece of St. Thomas More, we don't want to be people who just go with the flow. You know, we want to, there, want, there has to be a bit of John the Baptist in us, and even if, at the risk of being foolish and losing our jobs or whatever, like, and I even, it might sound funny, but because you've had such a big influence in my life, as I was speaking out boldly and, and maybe sometimes foolishly, I sometimes wondered to myself, I wonder what someone like Matthew Kelly, who has so much wisdom, what he would think about you know, some of us crazy guys who are kind of speaking out maybe foolishly. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's something I have thought an awful lot about, had a lot of conversations with many, many people about Um I think it 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 is something that is overwhelming, you know, and you know, even people like yourself and myself, I think it's overwhelming. When we start to really think about it and get into it, we become overwhelmed. I think it's important to pay attention to that because you know, the people we read uh, speak for and write for, uh, they get overwhelmed all the time. And one of the lessons I've learned about when I get overwhelmed is that I'm trying to do more in a 24-hour period than God wants me to do in that day, you know? And then to look at the, look at the day and say, okay, what here is of God and what here is of Matthew, and in particular, probably Matthew's ego, okay? And if we take those pieces out, do I still feel overwhelmed? And the answer usually is no. And so when it comes to crisis, I believe we all have a role to play, two parts of the role. Um, one is to speak truth, um, 
according to our station in life. You know, so if you or I were bishops and cardinals, there are things that we would be able to do that we are not able to do because of our station in, in, in life. And so our response needs to be in, in tandem with our vocation, with our station in life. Um, but they, I, I believe there should be a response from every person, even if that's just conversation with friends at dinner, um, is the first piece. The second piece is that, and I started writing a book about this that, that I never finished. Um, what the scandals have produced is what I've defined in this book as, as, a, as a faith wound. Okay, and these faith wounds are, are treacherous and, and devastating to an individual and to people close to an individual and usually to a community. Um, the problem with the faith wounds that were produced by the scandal is that it's like when someone goes to the hospital and get sick in the hospital, you know? And then they're like, I don't want to go to the hospital. Um, that's what happened. You know, people came to the church where they should be healed and they received these faith wounds. And then they're like, but I'm never going back there again. Okay, yeah, but that's, healing exists in that place. That's where you'll be healed. But no, I'm never going back there again. And not only are they not going back, but their friends aren't going back. Their families are going back. It drove millions and millions, tens of millions of people away from the from the church. And so I believe we have to be especially sensitive to the fact that, you know, almost anyone you don't and almost anyone you meet who doesn't go to church has a story. They most likely have a faith wound or are connected to someone who has a very deep faith wound. And I think we have to be, I think we have to go very gently in those situations. I think that we have to, to bring them a friendship that they have never seen before. Um, and just, just pray for them and love them uh, because they are hurting and and they have separated themselves from their best chance at healing so it it really is um it's it's treacherous and diabolical on a number of levels yeah 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 keep keep us guys in your prayers you know who are who are trying to navigate the the you know the whole whatever is speaking out trying to be part of the solution and not part of the problem and you know it's 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 been a challenge and uh because yeah I mean, it's one of those things two or three generations from now people will look back and say why didn't people do something why didn't they speak up why didn't they act you know and so you know we we, we want to be the people again you know thomas Moore, john fisher like who who are standing strong who are bringing the clarity and and you know especially now things seem to be getting even weirder in our culture in so many ways which i don't, don't want to get into today but it's just and i think especially as a priest I, there's an almost like an extra sense of obligation to bring clarity in a courageous way no matter what you know and that's not easy <laughs> so. yeah but um, you know i'll say one thing you know to you as a priest um, you asked me that, and we, uh, about a month or so ago, um, a priest we had full-time here on staff at Dynamic Catholic um, retired, and um, he came here after he retired from his diocese, and he had been here for almost 10 years. Um, and we had lunch with the whole staff, and one of the things I said to the staff was, um, you know, you know this priest, you know this man, you know, he has said mass every day for you, he has heard your confessions, he has married some of you and baptized your children, and um, and you've been able to drop by his office at any point, any time, 
um, over these 10 years. And I want you to reflect on this one question. How would the church be different if every Catholic knew one priest like this man we're celebrating today? And the, the reality is, is that the, the, the world would be radically different. The church would be radically different. And the, the power of the priesthood has not been diminished. Um, the reputation of the priesthood has been tarnished. But the power of the priesthood has not been diminished. And even people of, um, you know, questionable values and morals still hold respect for a priest. There's just something, I see it at work all the time. People who don't go to church, they still have this respect because the power of the priesthood is present. And, um, and so again, I think, I like what I say to so many people in so many situations, don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. And, yeah. and what you can do is, is very powerful. Yeah, well, that, that's beautiful. Here's a quote. I love this quote from, from your book here. Maybe my favorite quote. You say, it was the ordinary things that saved me. I have experienced enough extraordinary to know that I would choose the ordinary over the extraordinary all day long. Learn to cherish the ordinary. And then you say, make a list of 20 ordinary things that bring you joy when you experience them Consciously, and I, the next morning, my prayer time, I wrote a list of 20 things. Uh, what a beautiful quote. I agree with you 100%. You know, sometimes I'm part of a, a conference, maybe it's a youth conference, and it's energetic, and, and people are pumped up. And I always think to myself, this is awesome. This is beautiful. This is part of the Catholic experience. But it's not as awesome as, as folding laundry in the presence of God. And just being in his presence. Do you just want to comment on, you know, the, the, the beauty of ordinary life and how much of a gift it is? Yeah, I think firstly, um, it's important to understand that, you know, our human hearts, um, they, they long for, they yearn for, they covet the extraordinary. Um, in our quest for happiness, um, God has placed this desire for happiness in us. And almost everything we do is a quest to satisfy that desire that God has given us. Um, sooner or later we wake up and we realize he is the only uh, answer to that desire. He is the only one who can fulfill that desire. But we tend to chase the ordinary because we think that will give us greater pleasure or that will give us greater happiness or that sort of thing. Um, we chase shiny things. And the less recollected we are, the more we are likely to be mesmerized by the latest shiny thing. And, and we see that obviously in our culture where people are just moving from one shiny thing to the next in, in all their uh, shapes and forms. But if we, I, I think if we listen to our souls, you know, what really feeds us, what really quenches our thirst, you know, take a walk. Yeah. In a quiet place. Mm. Take a long walk in a quiet place. Take a short walk in a quiet place. It just changes you, you know? And and we neglect these ordinary things in favor of chasing these extraordinary things. And, it, you know, I understand the criticism, you know, even uh, some of my brothers will say to me, well, that's all right for you to say. You know, you've experienced almost every extraordinary thing that this world has to offer. Um, and that is true, uh, but that doesn't make the point less valid. I think it makes the point more valid, um, that the ordinary things feed the soul in a way that, that the extraordinary things simply do not. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have extraordinary experiences. That doesn't mean extraordinary experiences aren't part of God's plan for us. I absolutely believe that they are. But at the end of the day, knowing that true north is in the ordinary things, I think is 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 critical to to growing in wisdom. Um, and I, I, high on the list of ordinary things is daily routine. 
you know yeah. if we think about little children they thrive in routine they thrive in routine take their routine away from them you know and they they melt down uh, yeah. we we may be in bigger bodies but uh, the same is true we thrive in routine yeah. take the routine away and people melt down yeah. uh, you see that in the airport right a flight gets delayed and all of a sudden some 50 year old man is throwing a tantrum and it's like okay well you want to get on a plane that might crash or you want to wait until they fix the plane it's like what <laughs> yeah yeah, the the or like I'm I'm a routine junkie. I love my daily routine and all that. But, but in particular, like in the presence of God, you know, I'm sure you've read Brother Lawrence of the Resurrections book, Practice of the Presence of God, and I just, I mean, God's presence, His love, as we do our duty, as we do His will. I think it was Sister Lucia from Fatima. She had a saying from her first community: um, God, Your will is my paradise you know and I, I think to myself like oh that's that's so true and and so the ordinary things if you if it's time to to make a salad or if it's time to you know uh, answer a few emails or, or whatever it, that's that's where we find god's presence and you know his presence you know is better than better than anything else you know so beautiful question made me think of um i attended mass with sister lucia um when I was writing my book, The Rhythm of Life, mm -hmm. which was my first enormous bestseller. And um, and really, it's like that presence of God is found in, in, in that rhythm, right? God created everything in creation with rhythm. Tides come in and go out to a rhythm. Your heart pumps blood through your body to a rhythm. Photosynthesis based on a rhythm. Just there's rhythm in creation. And, and when we... When we listen to the rhythm and abide by the rhythm we are in the presence of god and and when we break that rhythm is so much collateral damage to ourselves to other people um it's a really powerful uh, memory you've just um, evoked for me yeah yeah that book rhythm of life uh, that was a game changer in my life also by the way really Really enjoyed that book, Rhythm of Life. Okay, last quote from your, your book here, Life is Messy. The wisest people of every age have pondered death and eternity, not as an exercise in morbidity, but in order to live life to the fullest. Now, I want to ask you, and this is kind of not exactly related, but and this is kind of a fun ending to our interview. I think we all have a sense of what heaven might be like. Maybe even the Lord has given us a little hint, a revelation. We know that heaven, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it so much done on man. It's beyond our wildest imagination. But there's something, even in this, or some things in this life that, that are kind of a hint. And so we say, well, you know, for me, heaven, it's going to be like taking a beautiful walk through a field or whatever. Do you have an image or a sense of heaven that kind of captivates you that you dream of when you dream of heaven? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creator, I'm an artist, I'm a, a writer, I'm a, and so I think that experience um, is a spiritual experience. Uh, I, um, I wrote and rewrote the last three paragraphs of this book uh, probably 20 times, uh -huh. maybe longer. And, and this is what I ended up with. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take risks with your goodness. Test the limits of your goodness. Don't just love, astonish people with your love. Don't just dabble in generosity. Live a life of staggering generosity. How would your life change if your only goal was to do as much good as possible? Let's find out. Don't let this question remain unanswered. Celebrate goodness every chance you get. Don't waste your gold dust. So that last line, right? Don't waste your gold dust. It's like everyone who's read the book has asked me, how did you come up with it? How did you come up with it? And obviously, it comes from the story that's early in the book. We didn't cover it, but we'll talk about that next time. And it's like, 
how did you come up with it? How did you come? And it just happened. And I wish I knew how it came up with it, but it just, it happened in the middle of the night. I'm rewriting this thing for the 20th time. And it just comes to me. And it is a moment of pure inspiration. Don't waste your gold dust. And it's like, I tell people, I wish I knew how I did it because I'd recreate it. I'd recreate it every single day. I'd recreate it every single moment. But it, it is things like that, that, that I think are, are powerful, but multiply that by infinity and take it to the depths of eternity. And I think we still have a barely a glimpse of what heaven, the experience is. But I do think that these things give us insight. Children, you know, the birth of your first child, the birth of your last child, the birth of any child, I think is, is, a, um, is an experience that, uh, you know, we talk about seeking union with God. It's like God just grabs you and you, there's no choice but to have union. It's like, mm, you're just, we are together. We are united. Uh, so there, I think there are many experiences in life that, that give us a glimpse, but just a glimpse. Amen. Beautiful. Well, listen, thank you so much for, for taking some time with me. Did you want to mention just some of the things you're up to, uh, how people can get a copy of Life is Messy or your other books or some of your new initiatives? Absolutely. So Life is Messy. I'm excited about it. Um, people can pre-order a copy at Dynamic Catholic right now. It doesn't come out until the 15th of August, but Dynamic Catholic is shipping copies right now. So if, if people want a copy of Life is Messy, they can get it there. Uh, you did mention Our Father. It is a book that's out of print, but Dynamic Catholic does have about 50 copies of it. So if someone wanted a copy, they can, they can grab that in the shopping cart there. Um, I'm really trying to grow my YouTube presence. I've been on the road for 30 years, um, traveled all over the world. I now have five children under the age of 11. So I'm trying to use YouTube to reach more and more people. So hopefully people will visit my channel and subscribe to my channel and uh, we can stay in touch that way. But I would love to come back and speak with you again anytime. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, blessings on you and, and your family and your ministry. And uh, um, yeah, let's, let's keep in touch. Viva Cristo Rey. Amen. Great to be with you. Thank you.